So at, I can't remember now, 12, 13 pounds each. And you just think, wow, this is, forget it, get it. <laughs> bunch of losers. You know, we're going to do this. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and then we, we ended up with uh, three over, and then we had another couple in the pipeline. But we quickly worked out that we'd messed up because uh, once we did some analysis, we just saw what was happening. We realised there is no shipping barrier to entry. Any person with a million quid in the shed, you put up a trampoline course, they're all coming in, you, you can't sew up the, the supply chain, it's coming in from China. And uh, within 18 months, there are over 200 trampoline parks in the country, and it is just chaos out there. And so we, we, our analysis was you can either buckle down, fund it for the next five years, and there'll be blood on everywhere, and then two or three people will emerge as profitable businesses, or you can say, good luck to you, and sell to the biggest, the highest bidder. And uh, we sold the highest bidder, and we sold out in June. Um, and I am so glad we have, because it's a uh, real distraction, and I see their numbers, and I wouldn't want to do that. So, um, what a relief. And there is a lesson there, which is, you know, if you've made a mistake, admit it first of all to yourself, and then uh, do something about it. So I think that's called drowning the puppies, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have learned this the really hard way. Our BGP, whatever it is, love and sweat, um, great plan. You probably all know this back to front, but in the bottom left quadrant, you've got here existing products to existing customers. You know, sell more of what you do to your existing customers. We'll try and do that, it's called marketing. Um, the next one is new stuff to your existing customers. Uh, sorry, no, sorry, it's a uh, geographical spread. So we have a geographical spread into the US, we now operate in 16 states in America. Uh, we're still growing up in the UK. Um, and uh, you know, it's what you know, you set up to do that, and you can do it easily. Third area is new stuff to your existing customers. So this is the innovation. Um, again, you understand your customers, you want, you've got the infrastructure, bring in new things, uh, <coughs> that helps with your number one, which is marketing, uh, new for, the one that has airspace banana skins is new stuff to new markets or selling stuff you don't understand to people you've never met before. And it can work, but you're a startup. You're, you're, you're shaking the dice again, aren't you? So, best avoided, I now realise. In fact, I think you guys told me that. But, um, so, where have we got to? Well, we've had seven or eight million people that have, have gone eight. And despite ourselves, we've managed to do okay. Um, we've got a revenue of um, something like 34 million pounds, something like that. Um, and it's great. You know, we've got loads of challenges, loads of stuff. With, we've got a team of about 12 to 1,500 people in the UK and the USA. I mean, we've talked about USA. You know, we're, always, we're always nearly getting it right in the States. We will get it right this year. Um, and the point I want to leave you with is on your three chasms, you know, pro proving the concept, chasm one, uh, you do that at the beginning. Chasms two and three don't go away because at various stages in your journey, you start them again. And if you look at people, the kind of people that you need at different stages of your growth are, they just change. Some people will grow, the maturity probably will not, and that may include you. It may include you. Um, and so you have to assess that, because if you haven't got the right real senior team, the drive and the vision and the hunger to go to the next stage, if you get a bit fat and you know, a bit too well off, then that could be a real problem. And um, your systems as well, and your innovation. You can't just do the same thing forever. So um, that's what I'm going to leave you with, and I hope uh, you found it interesting.
Um, there should have been. You're absolutely right, there should have been. Actually, I'm not, I've just last week received a 171 page market research uh, report where we've spoken to 3,000 you know, representative sample of the country and we've got a 950 strong survey of our own um, customers. So I'm not dissing market research, I think it's really important. But as a startup, if you've got the pockets and you've got the time to waste, stroke, spend, fine. But it can be an excuse for interaction, in my view. And that sometimes you just got to follow your gut and go for it. Um, the other thing is, there's a, as you get bigger, you, things, if you're not very, very careful, things take longer. You think, oh, I've got all these teams, I'll be really quick. But you, you feel like you're wading through treacle sometimes. I mean, we've got a marketing team of, of 12 or 13 people, um, and they're all really busy, they're all working really hard, and they're doing a good job. But we just get a third as much done as we did when we had three people. And uh, that's something you need to address, and you've got to keep on fighting. And sometimes going off and saying, well, I need to report, we need to wait six months, it's, it's, just, it's an excuse for inaction sometimes. <coughs> so, hang on, what's the question? One of the principles you might like to think about, and I, I guess it would apply to uh, Tristan and, and uh, Jerome and the others, is the notion of affordable loss. So if you're going to act on something, if you can afford to lose, say, 10,000, 20,000 pounds, it's better to just go up and do it. You don't have that as a resource. You can figure out what is, the, what is your risk level, I guess. Is, you know, how far can you go? I think actually, I'm just pushing my family one step too far. So, uh, I like the very early days, probably had some savings, we would just have some savings. We can go this far, it's cheaper to start it than to keep on doing uh, desk research. Well, what he actually did is he, he uh, mitigated his risk by uh, selling his wife's flat. <laughs> <laughs> by selling his wife's flat. <laughs> 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 if you had a question, Dan, I will come to you in a second. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, you talked about investing money. And it seemed it was post 2010 that um, you focused a more on your brand and financially investing in that. More towards 2005, 2006 time when you were growing, how did you make those decisions of financially sacrificing your income for your brand, for developing processes? Yeah. Um, one of the brilliant things about my brother and his wife is they are natural marketeers. And they were able, we had, we had something new for the country, so at first that was, I know it was iconic. So it, it was easy to generate PR. And it's very visual, um, photogenic, and people hadn't seen it before. So you've got national press coming to them, and Trust made the most of it. So he was very good at developing a brand, punching way above our weight uh, in the early days. As you become more of a mature business, you start to put in strategies in order to generate that. And you always see the worst side of it, because I think we've got work to do there. Um, but brand is so important. I, I focus on the racial talk. I focus on our internal brand, because it's looking after our customers. And that does look after your customers. But um, what, uh, it's, it, it's, it's what separates you from your competition, is how people view the theme that they get when they, when they think about your brand. Um, I think it's, you know, when, I'm just a bit nervous by saying, oh yeah, you should spend lots of money on it. Because it's fundamentally, it's not about money. It's about your brand being a true reflection of you. you know, that it is true. That's 80% of it. You do then need to, if you're not, in, if you're not lucky enough to have a sort of intelligent brand um, concept, then the rest of it is, is talking. So if PR is talking and it should be free. Uh, and it's only after that that you, you, should, you should pay. You be right. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question is also about the brand. I think the brand name is, is very clever, very inspirational. I mean, did you always have that from the outset? Did you, did you go through several iterations? The, the brand name uh, was always from the outset, or very shortly after the outset. And, uh, yeah, there's a story behind that, but the, uh, so, uh, yes, but the, we've gone through various iterations of brand guidelines. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask um, 
how did you make the transition from being a barista to actually running a business like this? Okay, um, so nepotism is the truth of answer, <laughs> my brother. Um, but the, the <coughs> leaving that bit aside, uh, I think the bar is a fantastic training ground actually. Uh, I didn't realise it at the time. I, I knew I didn't want to be a barrister all my life, but I thought I didn't have any transferable skills. But actually you do. Um, you, you're very good at analysing data and um, absorbing a huge amount of information and seeing what the core issues are as a barrister. Um, legal knowledge is always useful for a small business. Uh, there's an awful a lot of contractual stuff and, um, and in our particular area where there's uh, personal injury uh, risk and litigation risk and insured risk, then that was helpful, directly helpful. But I think, um, you know, business is common sense, isn't it? You know, the, the vast majority of business is common sense. If it feels right, if it feels sensible, it probably is. Uh, that gets you a good long way. It gets you far enough so you can afford to uh, employ really clever people. And um, we now employ uh, people who are significantly better at our jobs than we are. And um, you know, in particular, uh, we, we employed a commercial director uh, in the mid last, start in the middle of last year. And he's just so much better at my job than I am. And so I'm increasingly realising that we'll be like, well, <laughs> I'll take the credit, you do work. Um, and I think, you know, I think I made a bit of a point saying sometimes you need to recognise it's you that that's, they can't quite make the next step or don't want to. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to think that. I, know, I haven't resigned yet, but there you go. So, who was behind that question? I just graduated last year and I got my law degree. So, well the family business that we have is completely different. So, I was trying to understand what hurdles you have to go through or what attitude you have to have or what you did particularly that I think. Well, I, I just think law is a great trade. Um, actually, accountancy is unbelievably dull, but it is a great trade ground for, for business as well. But, um, uh, the other thing is uh, advocacy. I mean, I was a barrister, so I spent a lot of advocacy for. I was a practice for ten years, and uh, you may not have seen it today. But the uh, being able to gain your way when negotiating, and you know, we've got make or break. We want this place. We want this course. We want this landowner to to go with us and not with someone else. Then being able to be well, first of all, personal, being you know, real, but also having some of the the, the, the training of being at the bar definitely helped and, and continue, continues to help actually. So I think it's a great, well, well done for getting a law degree. I think it's a really good training for you, whatever you use it for. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, please. Your, your ventures overseas, I mean, are they collaboration partnerships? How do you, how do you spread the risk? Okay. Or are they the McDonald's? You franchise no, because we can kill people. Um, but mind you, I suppose they can the McDonald's. <laughs> but the, um, the we, we we're not comfortable um, having a having a franchisee with our brand uh, operating remotely. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the main statement. Um, and we start off with a joint venture in America. So essentially, people a bit like us saw what we were doing, said, uh, "We'll come and replicate it in America. You provide the IP, we'll provide the cash, and do what we're doing." That was the idea. Uh, like all the best laid plans, it didn't work out like that. Um, and it increasingly became, they ran out of money, we provided the idea and the cash, and they weren't that good at doing that yet. So um, yeah, we should have done it earlier, but we're you know, friends and all the rest of it. I removed them um, two years ago, 18 months ago, and bought them out. So we're now, we now have an incentivized management team, but we own 92% of our business, and it's, yeah, it's a successful plan. And that's great because you can, you know, they got us started, they got us being an American team in America, but now we can rip it a little bit more. Oh, are they autonomous? Uh, they, are they autonomous? It's quite hard to be autonomous if you can get 92% shareholders, but they are. Basically. <laughs> um, so we have, we have a managing director in America um, and, a, and a full management team in the head office in America because you can't. We can't run it as English people from 3,000 miles away. So we back their judgment, but uh, I'm obviously on the board and I speak to our managing director there every week, sometimes 
as we uh, like spend a fair amount of time in America. So they can't, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative process led by them that has to be agreed by us. I suppose is how you, how you put it. Um, I was very interested to hear um, what you said about the brand values, and obviously um, you said that you focused it on, on the internal brand. Um, you know, where in the sort of evolution of, of this from the start up to where you are today, did you realise, right, we've really got to focus on this now, and how much of it was sort of already there in, underneath and you just needed to write it down, and, and you know, what didn't you tell yeah. us about your external brand that you can summarise very quickly? Well, that's it. Before I say everything, I'm not a marketeer. Uh, so I, I can't give you all the, the spiel. Um, the trust room is passionate, and it, it, it just shows. Particularly in the early days when it was, you know, he was fighting, and he built the first course with the French, and he was you know, working 15 hours a day. Um, and so when you're small, you, you, I don't think you necessarily need to have codified your brand, because it's, you know, 